But before I start, I should make it clear that give a usual disclaimer that this presentation reflects solely my personal views and not necessarily those of the IMF executive board or IMF management. Next slide. And this slide, it, uh, what we're trying to show um, is the comparative size of longevity risk out there in the market. Um, and by longevity risk, I mean in, that resides in the corporate private sector arena um, and it compares it to the amount of actual transfer taking place. You'll see here, since about 2007 in countries with large corporate sponsored defined benefit pension plans, um, sponsors are transferring the related investment and longevity risk to life reinsurers and insurers. And that's driven mainly by the in, um, the invest uh, lower the lower investment returns that we're, we're all experiencing these days, and also back in 04 and 05, 06, particularly the introduction of stricter pension disclosure standards and uh, regulations. Um, but nevertheless, the cumulative longevity risk transfer in these countries is a fairly small fraction of the total exposures. Actually, about three percent in the five countries with the largest preponderance of um, defined benefit related obligations. And so one of the points that I'm trying to make in the paper is that the reinsurance capacity for such transfers could be enlarged if their longevity risks could be distributed to capital markets. So what I'm going to summarize here some of the impediments to capital market access and look to catastrophe risk transfer markets and recent academic literature to see if there's any hints as to how these impediments can be overcome or not. Um, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so these, these are the workhorses of the longevity risk transfer market. Uh, that the buyouts are, I think they, um, in the US, I think we call them bulk annuities. Um, transfer, they transfer all the pension fund assets and liabilities to an insurer. Um, whereas a buy-in, they transfer just the risks. And so the insurer um, basically, um, well, the way, the way it works, both cases, um, you can see um, the pension plan sponsor pays an upfront payment, um, but the difference is that in a buyout, um, the sponsor no longer maintains a direct responsibility for paying pensions. It's, it's transferred over to the insurance or reinsurer. In a buyout, the sponsor basically outsources all those responsibilities to the reinsurer. And there's various regulations in place to ensure that the reinsurer will stick around to meet those obligations. Um, underfunded plans tend to prefer buy-ins um, so they don't have to recognize the funding gap as an accounting loss. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so in most jurisdictions, banks are not allowed to issue annuities or otherwise take on longevity risk. That's an insurance business. Um, but they can take um, a longevity risk indirectly via swaps. Um, and the way a longevity swap works is that um, the, um, the, the sponsor um, pays a swap premium. Uh, actually, it can go both ways. It's a swap, uh, swap payment that's spread over the life of the contract based on the difference between actual and expected benefit payments. And um, sponsors typically combine those with liability-driven investment um, strategies um, to make sure that the expected cash flows um, meet the expected benefit payments. Um, they also seem to be of quite a minimal to large size. Um, there's been a couple of large swap transactions. Um, and the, the, in 2002-2013, um, Dutch insurer Aegon did a 12 billion swap with Deutsche Bank and then a 1.4 billion swap with SopGen. So, Big size is achievable here with these these swaps, and they tend to be based on standard derivatives documentation. They involve margin payments and all those good things. Um, these are both 20-year deals with close-up mechanisms that determine the final payment, um, and uh, the payments. Well, so the, these back-and-forth payments were floored and capped, so that no investors aren't exposed to open-ended risk if longevity risk is either under or overestimated. Next slide. And here we get to the what we call the holy grail of longevity risk transfer. And they've been talking about this for the last decade or so. They, we want to activate more capital market interest. So swaps, we just talked about, that's, that's one of the ways that it can be done. Um, but um, the other holy grail um, product is the longevity bond. And the way a longevity bond works is that uh, it pays out coupons that are linked um, to the number of survivors in, in the population. So it basically pays out a decline in a series of coupons as the proportion of survivors um, declines. And there have been two attempts at issuing longevity bonds, both by AAA rated institutions. One was by the European Investment Bank in 04 and World Bank in 2010, but both were canceled um, due to lack of interest on both the buy and the sell side. Next slide. 
So this kind of summarizes what 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 the paper summarizes the main impediments to the growth um, in capital market interest. So one of the biggies is um, counterparty risk because these things can be very very long, and that's mitigated typically by the posting of collateral um, in the form of highly liquid um, securities. Um, Catch with that is that the, those securities can often be in short supply or very expensive. Um, so this consideration favors longevity swaps, which collateralize only a difference between those 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 cash flow payments. And the other the other catch is that longevity risk hedgers or sellers, I the, say the insurance company, they they want customized contracts so they can maximize the effectiveness and coverage of the risk transfer. Um, and uh, also there's regulatory reasons for that. They're seeking out regulatory relief and they need that, that, that basis risk needs to be reduced to a very minimal amount. So standardization um, tends to work against that, yet that's what, that's what the market wants. Longevity risk buyers prefer standardized contracts based on mortality indices to, so they can maximize market liquidity, create fungible securities and all those good things. So that, that's another tension um, between the, the two sides of the transaction. Another problem is the lack of reliable granular mortality data, which makes it difficult for both sides to measure and risk um, and measure and risk manage the longevity risk. And, and life tables in some jurisdictions are not updated frequently enough, and they're only available for highly aggregated population groups. Um, there, were, back in between 05 and 2010, there were several efforts to create um, um, indices that were publicly available and, and fairly granular and, and and I, I, I haven't looked at this for the last, say, five years or so, and I'm surprised to see that almost all of them have disappeared. There's one called Club Beta that uh, was going to be the, the cat's meow of um, longevity indices, but it's now gone private. So um, it's really of not much use um, to a, a you know a, fun, a functioning market. Also, the, on the supply side, the supply of longevity risk, um, there's some cross-border reinsurance frictions that um, that can can, uh, can lead to the the market breaking down. I mean, they're they're easing. So you'll see a company like um, the U.S.-based Prudential. They're doing a lot of them um, business in the U.S. So that's that's a factor that's kind of um, dying off. Um, the other thing, buyers face problems of asymmetric information. Needless to say, because you know the ones with the, the longest lived populations are likely to be the biggest risk sellers. So that's another problem. That you know, there's ways of dealing with it in the product design, but it is another impediment. To, um, and also the, another biggie is that investors generally prefer shorter duration contracts, whereas um, a full covered coverage product would go out, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. I and mean, that's much too long for um, typical investors. Next slide. So this this is where we get to the part where we look where briefly at, cumul at uh, adjustory risk transfer markets, which, um, you know, have been, again, they're, they, actually, when I first started thinking about the update in my, my database, I thought, yeah, cat risk markets are really big deal. There's lots of interesting things happening there. But actually, when you do the same kind of analysis I did earlier to show that um, that uh, longevity risk transfer only comprises three percent of the um, available longevity risk transfer, um, it's it's better. It's fifteen percent in cat risk markets. There's been about a hundred billion cumulative uh, transactions taking place, and the denominator for that is about five hundred billion. And um, sorry for the small size of the charts, but uh, the, the right one kind of tells you the different product types, which I won't have time to get into, um, but I have a table coming up that will help with that. So on to the next slide. So this is a brief glimpse of mortality bonds, which you might think would be uh, give you some hints as to how um, cat, um, longevity bonds might work. And and um, but you know if you look at the scale on that chart, there hasn't been very many of them done, and I'm not going to get into detail here about a different. Uh, different permutations and combinations, just noting that um, there's been a famous situation recently where the World Bank, well, the World Bank issued a pandemic bond in 2017 that uh, actually was triggered by the current crisis. So that's become, this product's become rather newsworthy. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, this is the table that sort of summarizes the, the different product types and their characteristics. So again, you see investors prefer shorter terms, um, shorter terms offset low liquidity, concerns, um, and counterparty risk is mitigated with collateralization. Um, transparency tends to be high, which is important to produce viable markets. And, and that transparency also mitigates some, some moral hazard risk, but not all. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this just summarizes some of the literature that, uh, that, that addresses the 
viability of vibrant longevity risk markets. And it's kind of a mixed mixed bag. There's a, um, that, uh, there's a paper by Michelson Mulholland and also by Cairns and L. Bowie that uh, that proposed design tweaks that may trigger more capital market interest. Um, but then some other papers paint a possibly bleak picture. There's a paper by Mitten and Brockett that uh, that say that basically um, sponsors aren't that interested in, in maximizing, and insurers too, in maximizing the the, um, the amount of transfer, even though it makes annuity holders better. Um, this is from a very corporate finance perspective. Um, this, it actually reduces the value of that shareholder effective put. Um, so, and then Zelenko analyzed that a Chilean um, longevity bond attempt. This is the one actually was done by the World Bank, and 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 he claims that the the problem is a moral hazard one. They perceived likelihood that the government would bail out any reinsurers or pension funds or annuitants that are hit by systemic longevity risk events. And last slide. So and the last slide just summarizes basically all the things we just um, talked about there. So standardized data is important. Um, that would and also uh, would open the door to investors who prefer shorter terms to maturity. Another key uh, thing is that uh, people seem to prefer value-based products. And remember, I mentioned before with that swap that it had a closeout date, so it got to it got to that 20-year point, and then you close it out completely, and you calculate a value based on some agreed-to um, life life curves. That seems to be very attractive to both sides. And then the other last um, key takeaway, and this kind of relates back to some of the academic literature. That there's a, there, it might be worth trying a cap on like tranche principle at risk structure. Actually, another way of thinking about it is a, a, a is more like a collateralized debt obligation, which got a bad name out of the crisis. But a, a tranche structure like that might work, where only the extreme longevity risk is um, transferred. But the bottom line is that uh, I was hoping to do this update of my 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 data and find that uh, you know things are really percolating along here. But it turns out that in fact um, the uh, the um, the markets are still rather moribund, I would say. Thank you.